What? You're in fragments? What do you think you are? Silicon? Welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon. I'm your host, Adam. Joining me as always are my co-conspirators, Gollix and Pettyfan. Um, so let's get to the news. Uh, right. Petty, you're up once again since, you know, we kind of have to keep, keep getting updates about your eye. My eye has actually been doing fairly decent. Like, the pain's mostly gone. The redness seems to be gone. I can actually kind of look at like lower like computer level light now, though like going out in bright sun still is a problem. I mean, I think the overall important thing is you're showing great signs of improvement. Yes, which means you know your your eye is eventually going to be fine. Yeah. No, no, you know, no surgeries or no. blindness for you. Yeah, I guess it depends if I do end up getting a the if there ends up being a scar where it is and the severity of it would be the only thing. Like if it's in a spot where like sunlight still causes an issue, they still may need to do like a minor like laser to touch up the scar, but that'd be about it, and not like a whole cornea transplant or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And then Luna, over the weekend, we found a lump on her throat. So we spent all weekend freaking out, thinking, oh no, does Luna have cancer? Oh no, is this her thyroid acting up? Turns out doctor thinks it's either um, an infection, like she like, scratched herself or something, it's just a little, infect- a little bit of an infection... Or it's, at worst, a benign fatty tumor. So, Luna's going to be fine. She just just lives on chaos, apparently. And driving her humans insane. I mean, it is a cat, so... Yeah. Yeah, she's my little chaos gremlin. Yeah. It's again, cat. Mm-hmm. And um, from Gamefly, I got um, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom to, that I've been messing around with, so... Woo! Mm. Okay. Anything and, else? Uh, not really. All right, Galax, it's your go. Well, our moving into the new office has been delayed uh, again. So I'm still working from home, uh, but that has still been going well. <sighs> I've, uh, I guess the biggest issue is, I don't know, I've been tired, and I don't know, maybe some of it's from spending way more of my time in my room, because that's the only place we could set up my work computer, really. Hopefully you don't need to go to, like, the doctor or anything. No, I just, I, I, I'm hoping that once I start being in more places, it'll help. I don't know. Uh, but otherwise, it's been pretty uh, normal, I guess. Um, Still been playing Pokemon Scarlet mostly, uh, though I don't have a whole lot left to do on the DLC. Mostly just beat up the uh, really hard trainers. Mm-hmm. So, that's probably about it. Alright, uh, I guess it's my go. Uh, let's see. Well, I guess, you know, um, 
my news this week isn't so much involving me, but um, family affairs um, have crept up uh, recently. And it's like, I'm trying to remember if I mentioned this before, but I suppose if I haven't, uh, here and now is as good a place as any, um, such as it is. But um, you know, it's one of those things that's not easy to reach because it's such a heavy topic. Uh, you know, but the long and short of things is my brother is getting a divorce. I suppose it's more a divorce is landing on his lap since it's actually his wife who's going to be filing. Like, so that's kind of thrown a big uh, fat monkey wrench into the holiday planning. Um, you know, we are in, still intending to, like, um, spend time with him over the holidays and his, and his kids and, you know, do the birthday thing. But, you know, that is up in the air at best because... You know, divorces are a ugly thing, and one never knows when things will go south, so to speak. Um, I suppose worst comes to worst, they just come here for uh, either Thanksgiving or Christmas. But uh, kind of a play it by ear situation. Um, anyway, in terms of gaming. Um, let's see. Last night I finished the last bits of Quake Two, um, the night that I have remaster. Um, went through the Nintendo sixty four campaign, and I have gotten all the achievements um, for that. Mainly because all of the achievements in Quake Two are basically complete the thing, and I've completed all of the things, single player things at that. Um, I have, you know, um, haven't uninstalled it because I still need to do, well, we still need to do some multiplayer in that. Like, now that Petty Fan's eye is better, you can finally put that back on the schedule. I can see. I can fight. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that, yes. Like, um, you know, I'll look into where I can fit that in after we're done here. Yeah. And you know MSP. Um, anyway, um, I have since moved on in terms of personal gaming to Baba Is You. Um, you know the indie puzzle sensation from not uh, from you know not too long ago. You know, the the one where you replace the words and you are the thing and you know if you I know don't it, remember you know. that one. Um, it was named uh, the Game Maker's Toolkit's most innovative game a few years back. Hmm. Like, um, you know, I've only played a few levels, but it, um, it's clever. I'll, um, it's just I haven't had a, a whole bunch of time because I'm also kind of helping my mother with um, her illness. It's mm. Nothing serious. She just has an upper respiratory infection and needs me to get things and drop them off to her yeah. because you know um so yeah it's been well quite frankly tedious having to go out and you know uh having to go to you know x place pick up thing dr and drive by her place and drop it off constantly but you know you, you do what you have to do anyway so that's my news for the week. So, Merrily, we shall roll along to the interview portion of the broadcast. And, uh, hang on, wrong window. And anyway, joining us this week is Josiah Colburn of Turning Wheel LLC. Greetings, greetings. Thanks for okay. having me on. No problem. Thanks for being with us here today. Um, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. It was, uh, it was, fun being along for the ride for the first part of your show i uh, i don't think i've ever heard uh, a conversation like a podcast style situation open up that way before and i think it's really neat how i don't know how personal it is uh yeah like that it, stuff matters and it's cool that you guys share it yeah yeah like it's kind of when we do it here and we do it on the other show as well like 
Um, just kind of a thing that evolved, I suppose. Anyway, uh, speaking of such things, um, we also like to get to know um, like the guests that we have on the program. Um, and we start by doing... Uh, by asking this particular question, what got you interested in video games, both on a personal and a professional level? Um, well, my that's a fun question. So, um, some of my earliest me- memories are actually of video games. Uh, so I grew up in uh, East Tennessee, I guess. Uh, those are my earliest childhood memories, and. Um, my dad, in order to do some of his courts work, I believe he was getting a master's at the time, he decided to get a computer. And so uh, some of the games that we had from that era in the you know mid-late 80s uh, are just like burned into my memory. And so I remember playing the, uh, the port of the Donkey Kong arcade game, uh, Space Invaders, the color version of Space Invaders. And a game that probably no one has heard of called Captain Beeble. And these are these are just games that I was just uh, was kind of obsessed with as a, I guess you could call me a toddler. Like, I was very, very young when I remember playing these. And so, like, I, you, even then, most of my waking moments were interested in going and going back to play video games. So that stayed with me through, you know, all of my childhood. I remember uh, my kindergarten class even had some kind of top-loading Atari system. I'm not sure which model it was. And they had Defender on there. And every time there was, like, free time in class, um, because we didn't always go out. Like, sometimes it'd be storming out. Um, I would always, every single time, I would ask the teacher if she could set up the game console. And she she maybe did it, like, a total of three times. And it was just, you know, my obsession. So, so yeah, it's kind of where my personal interest started. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions about that before I move on. But, yeah, very early, like, my earliest memories. Well, um, we find that oftentimes with our guests, those childhood obsessions or immersions uh, ended up being like the baseline for fueling them to, you know, make video games for a living. Is that the case with you? Uh, It would be really hard to separate it because for all of my childhood gaming was my primary primary hobby. Uh, I was the youngest kid and we didn't always have a lot of kids my age around to play outside with and so like the the computer was definitely just the most accessible hobby for me and so when games when i started playing games it started including editors of various kind kinds i naturally just wanted to explore those editors as well as just part of you know what it meant to use a computer and you know when i was when i was sick of getting killed in captain beeble for example i might even just load up the text editor just to like see if i could draw shapes using ascii um, just to like figure out what a computer can do. And so it was a natural progression. Uh, there's an old game called Dandy that's uh, like credited with being the predecessor to Gauntlet. Uh, mm. like it was, yeah, it's, it was a four-player co-op top-down action dungeon crawler, but it doesn't look anything like you would imagine a modern dungeon crawler to look like. Uh, like each of the characters was number... They were like numbers one, two, three, and four, but they had like a little pixel head and arms like just tacked on to them. Like, it just looked ridiculous. Um, but it's still, the, the, the gameplay uh, is very similar to Gauntlet in that you can run around and shoot in eight directions, and there are spawners that generate monsters, just like Gauntlet. But that game came with an editor. You could build your own levels in Dandy. And so uh, so I did. So that's that was, like, the first game editing stuff I did. I loved Dandy. I loved playing that with my dad and my brother and my sister. And... Um, and so getting a chance to edit it and like find that there's something that I can do even as a small child to make my own game experience was definitely formative. And that kept happening uh, over the years. Uh, I don't know, have you ever heard of a game called Dungeon Master? It's kind of a generic title, so it might sound familiar. I might have played that back in the day, or that might have been like Dungeon Explorer. Ah, Okay. So Dungeon Master, I think, came out in, like, 89. I want, I'm kind of wanting to say 87, but I think it was 89. But it came out for the Amiga and the Atari ST, and we had the ST version. And it included an expansion pack that lets you do uh, both level editing and portrait editing for your, like, your party of four heroes that you could recruit and go real-time dungeon crawling with. 
And it was all in a first person grid pace based perspective, uh, perspective kind of like legend of Grimrock if you've ever played that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's sort of like the grand, the granddaddy of those kinds of games, but it, it also included an editor. And so I was also excited to think around with that. So, I mean, but the, the story goes on. Like I, I was, I modded probably four or five more games obsessively before I ever got out of high school, you know? Right. And I'm guessing that played a part in your desire to make, um, video games. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I, I got some, I, I had the uh, mistaken impression as a, as a teenager that if I was going to make video games, I had to do programming. Mm -hmm. And part of that is just because that's all ha I had seen. Um, like, I, I didn't realize that the editors and stuff I was using was actually part of the work of making a video game. I thought that's just something that users like me did for fun. Um, and so I actually assumed that you know, in order to be involved in video games, I would either have to be a programmer or maybe I could work as an artist doing like 3D modeling or making cutscenes like the the Blizzard games blew us away back in right. the yeah, in the, the mid and late nineties, just like and I was like, Hey, I I I would be happy making cutscenes for these games even if I can't make them directly. So I I went uh, into college imagining that I would work on video game cutscenes and then slowly learned, oh wait, like People can actually make content for video games using these art skills and using these, uh, you know, even content creation skills of other kinds, like level designing. So, um, so yeah, uh, and, and it was. It's funny how similar the modding work I had been doing as a kid was to actual game production work. And so, when I got my first industry job, it was uh, like I hit the ground running. I was very motivated. I, you know was able to get going maybe faster than your average new hire who had quote unquote, no professional experience, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, uh, the first studio uh, that hired me was um, a little indie shop called super X studios. And they hired me to do animation, but I ended up coming on and doing, um, some 3d modeling and some mini game design for the Wii port a little later. And that was my, that was my first studio game job. Oh, ah, uh. What was it like working on the Wii? Um, so I'm like, uh, well, first off, I I, re I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've never worked on a game that I was just like, oh, I hate working on this game. Um, <laughs> you know, growing up and just being excited to play any game at all has kind of made me open to the concept that literally any kind of game can be awesome and I'd be excited to work on it, you know? And I have my own preferences, but every game job I had is uh, like I had to. I was stretching myself in di some different ways. So the Wii game was like a Pokemon Snap style wildlife safari where you're taking pictures. But on the Wii, we put on all these mini games because you have to. It's a Wii game, so it's got all these <laughs> mini games. Um, but I got to like I was so excited to just be able to pitch ideas for mini games using the motion controls. And my boss, a great guy named James Thrush. He's just like, okay, yeah, let's do all of those ideas. Like, and you know, just in a a couple of days, he had most of the ideas prototyped about, and you know, using motion controls in a way that I'd never used in any other game before. So, it's not that often in a game career that you get to make something that you've never played before and get to just try it out immediately and and see if it's fun or not. And um, so that we, even though I kind of look back at motion control like resentfully, like I think it's kind of a bad way to control games um it's still has i think it's perfect for mini games because it's just about it's just about expressing yourself through motion and that fun that it can bring even though if mechanically it's very imprecise and hard to get quote unquote good at doing you know um it was, so it was i guess it was it was sort of like playing with toys in a sandbox it's just fun in in that way it's just fun to engage with even if there's no deeper skill level to it or whatever right and uh, how long did you work there at uh, Super X? Uh, so I worked there over a period of years, and I wasn't employed with them the whole time. Uh, we kind of went from contract to contract uh, because, you know, super, super small studio wasn't always constantly funded. But um, the longest I worked with them consecutively was about, I want to say, two, two and a half years when we made... Uh, paintball game called Greg Hastings Paintball 2 and oh. that, 
Yeah, well, actually, yeah, the game's the game's pretty like the great paintball games get a really bad rap because they suck. Um, <laughs> but but the Greg Hastings paintball series was really the only paintball game that anyone would say was any good, and um, it was a series before I came on it, before our studio came on it. But we we made that game for the um, for the Wii and the PS3 and the Xbox 360. So I got a lot of platform experience on that. It was a nice small team, um, but w- without getting into all all the weeds of it, uh, it was a, it was a great place to because it was a small team. It was, a, it was a great place to explore all of my skill sets on the team and and enjoy some leadership opportunities. And uh, so I was I was sad when um, you know we prototyped our next game and. Uh, you know, I won't. I, I guess it would probably be a violation of NDA to tell you all about it. But it was it was a really fun game idea. We had some great play testings, uh, but we didn't. We weren't able to get a publisher to pick it up, so I wasn't able to continue at that studio, unfortunately. Mm. So is that when you moved into the indie space? Uh, I would. I mean, that was the indie space right there. Like we were a third party independent developer, and we got published by Majesco. And um, actually, I think both of our games were Majesco. Now that I think about it, mm. um, but yeah, we were just funded. Like we weren't, um, you know, we weren't studio owned. So that's sort of technically the third party indie relationship, you could say. So, but no, it was after that that I actually went corporate, and <laughs> I spent some time working for uh, Microsoft, and um, I was in indie game publishing for mobile studios for a while, mm. and. Um, then because it wasn't the kind of creative work I wanted to do is publishing work, you know, I wasn't really making games. I was just sort of like commenting on them. Um, not like a journalist either, just like, you know, as a publisher looking to make money off these indie games. Right, right. What's a good fit for the portfolio and such things? (laughs) Yeah, something like that. Um, I was, I was still looking for other work that I could feel like I could continue my career trajectory into something much more creative and so that's when i got into a little company called gas powered games which may sound somewhat familiar yeah Um, yeah yeah. they they've done some things uh, like the dungeon keepers here or um not dungeon keeper um trying to remember what it was dungeon siege i believe you're thinking that's it that dungeon siege yeah And Dungeon Siege was a really cool series. So I didn't get to work on Dungeon Siege. I came in a little while after they had finished Dungeon Siege 2 and Space Siege. And um, I believe they had also finished uh, Supreme Commander recently when I joined. Mm. And so that's when they got the the contract from Microsoft to develop Age of Empires Online. So I got to work on Age of Empires Online with the Gas Powered Games team and... The game studio, I believe, was split into two teams at that time. They had a project working for a big, uh, for I believe it was they were working for Disney on the other game. I never worked on that game, um, and I worked on uh, on Age of Empires Online for probably a year and a half or so, and had a ton of fun on that project. And that's another case where, like, I'm not really like I like playing RTSs. I did StarCraft modding. That was one of the games I modded in high school, like I was talking about. Um, but I never really considered myself like the biggest strategy game buff and especially not when it comes to Mediterranean war history. Like I much more prefer sci-fi and fantasy stuff, but working on age of empires online was such a hoot. Like I really got into it and enjoyed doing a ton of research about like, what were the wackiest, uh, nations of the bronze era that would be so fun to play as and just like cranking out concepts for them. And, um, I guess I'm, I'm like, I'm diving into that to illustrate that, you know, working on, like, it doesn't really matter what my, my personal preference is a lot of times, uh, what I've been making in my career. Like it's, it's just easy for me to get amped up about whatever project we're making, as long as it's, you know, as long as somebody really cares about it and it's fun. Hmm. Like, well, it's uh, good that you managed to have such an experience. Um, so I suppose, um, at what point did you head towards turning wheel? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, after, so Gaspar Games ended up getting shut down. Uh, that's the wrong way to say it. They tried to do a Kickstarter and it went and it didn't work out. And I remember that. 
Yeah. And, uh, and so the company was going to close. And so we got bought by Wargaming. And so I ended up working with Wargaming for a while. And, you know, I had done a good job at Gas Powered Games. I ended up getting promoted. I, I ended up staying through the merger or acquisition, whatever you want to call it. And mm-hmm. I, I got promoted up to art management. I was doing mostly art for these companies. And I enjoyed doing art, but like for me, the creative aspect was way more important. And because I was in management and because often in bigger game teams, art is just sort of like, like you send somebody a list of assets that you want to request. Like we need three walls and two flowers and a barrel. And like you just end up being the service department that provides whatever art they want. It was a very non-creative way to work (laughs) for me. And so, and because my day-to-day was like doing art team bean counting, like I wasn't actually doing artwork. I was just like, managing team uh, leads like the vehicle team and the character team and whatnot um and then making like working with the other directors to like figure out the schedule i wasn't doing literally like any creative work at all in games and i was getting paid well but it just wasn't satisfying and so i started to get desperate to look for side projects and like i mentioned before when i was even just a kid i was always looking for some hobby project to work on some mod or whatever so um i was looking around and you know, for, for something to contribute to uh, some team that might benefit from, you know, that energy that I had. And I ended up stumbling across on Steam. Uh, Barony had just come out in 2015. And so Barony 1.0 was, it was released completely without me. You know, I wasn't part of the, er- the early, early game development. The game had been in development for about two years before that. And I saw it and I was like, this is, and, and I bought it, of course, and and I was like, this is a game that's like everything that's up my alley. I've been looking for a game with a lot of like immersive sim elements. I like the first person. I'm hungry for co-op, um, and I love like retro dungeon fantasy environments. So like it was hitting on all um, cylinders for me. Like it was just a, it was exactly the kind of game I would want to make myself. In fact, I had pitched a game similar to that to Super X Studios when I had worked there. Um, and so, uh, so and this story's there's another tangent to take on this story before we get to how I ended up with the team, and that is that like a year before, a little game called Delver had entered early access. Have you guys heard of Delver? I think so. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good game. I'd recommend people check it out. Um, but it's a first person dungeon crawler, a lot like Barony is, roguelite. Um, actually, my it, it doesn't have a lot of progression mechanics, and it might you might stick with it, calling it a roguelike. But um, but I noticed like a few months after it went into early access, after I had had played it and finished it, and you know just updates are popping up in my feed, I see that Delver had this like amazing art overhaul that just like you know suddenly this game went from looking like something super janky and ugly and old to something that looked like you know I had a real art style to it, and it was. You know, kind of chibi, a lot of pixel art stuff, but it was cute. And I was like, dang, like, <laughs> like, why didn't I reach out to the, those guys and let them know that I would have loved to work on their team and do some art for them? Um, and so, <clears throat> so when I saw Barony and I played it for the first time and the, you know, the visuals were pretty bad <laughs> and there were some other things about it that screamed like, you know, it's a game with a lot of potential. Um, I remembered you know, when I saw Delver and I was just like, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to chicken out on this. Like, I'm going to go and find out who made this game and just talk to them and see if they want me involved. So that's what I did. I went um, cyber trolling and found the game's creator. And um, he was, you know, his name is Sheridan Rathbun, young guy. Uh, he, had, he had actually, uh, I think he left college in order to finish this game. And so here I was, I had like more than 10 years in the game industry and I had like a fancy title with a studio that people were familiar with. And I was like, hey man, can I help on your game? <laughs> and uh, and he's like, I mean, I don't have any money to give you. Like the game wasn't selling that well, he's, but like, so I'm, I'm, you know, I think it'd be great to work with you, but I don't have anything to offer. And I was like, don't sweat it, bro. I'll, I'll just, I'll just, you know, <laughs> make a bunch of new art for your game that I think will help it really sell. And if you use it, you can just cut me into the profits. And he's like, all right, this is a pretty low risk operation. So that's what we did. I joined the team and over the next like uh, six months, him and I were working together to release the first major overhaul of Barony called the cursed edition. And 
Um, and I replaced all of the art assets and added a few new dungeon rooms. And and that was in uh, we released that in 2016. So I've been on the team ever since. Um, and most of that time until last year, I was actually moonlighting. Like I was just that, that was this was a side thing I was doing just for the lolly jollies while I kept, you know, my professional career going in the background. So it's been it's been a t- it's been a time. It's been an experience. And just this last year, uh, we finally got enough sort of a grassroots awareness of Barony now that we can afford to work full time. And I started working full time for Turning Wheel last uh, July. So it's been going great. And how big is Turning Wheel these days? Uh, right now, I would say I think it's fair to say that it's it's a three person team full time. Um, uh, Sheridan didn't launch the project solo. He recruited a few people from um, game hobbyist forums back in the day to join up. So we still are in contact with several of those people. Um, the composer, his name is Chris Kukla. You know, we still ask him for music whenever we're making new uh, biomes. Um, and we have another artist named Matthew, and we uh, he does pixel artwork for us. So there's a few guys that we pay you know, in sort of on kind of a contract basis to help flesh out our team. But it's really three of us, me and Ben and Sheridan. Um, and Ben and Sheridan are programmers, and I'm just a guy who's not a programmer. I do the other things. Hmm. Like, and has the uh, hierarchy or, uh, like, the situation changed any over the years? like with the company like in terms of how you how you you know gather uh, the work from uh, these satellite members um contractors whatever you would classify them as Mm -hmm. um well you know when i first joined the team that this whole thing was started by sheridan and he deserves all the credit for you know starting the project and having a project idea that's compelling to people who would want to join the team and, you know, like joining an indie team is always like this risky endeavor. It's like it will very likely never pay off in the long run. Uh, so if, so if like if you don't love it, just don't bother doing it because the, the chances it'll result in a career is, are pretty low. But um, so so that's just to say that early on, you know, it was it was definitely uh, Sheridan running the show. And I, I wanted to make sure and respect his vision and his authority on the team. But as time went on, it became more and more like an organic development that what matters most is whoever's working hard on the game and whoever's passionate about it. Like that's where the game finds its success is, you know, those of us who are doing that, just like making the game a better version of itself. And so, and to Sheridan's credit, he hasn't held like this, uh, like he doesn't have this bureaucratic view or hierarchical view of how the company has to work. And so the three of us now, me, Ben, and Sheridan, we we work effectively as equals. Um, it's really important to the three of us that uh, you know nobody's getting sort of strong armed into doing any kind of work they don't that they hate or or that they're going along with something that they, is not going to be personally building off their passions because we acknowledge that like the reason why the game is as good as it is these days, and you know, or at least in our opinions, is because we let our passion live through the game. And so we want to stay out of each other's way on that front. Like it's my, not Sheridan's job to control my work or his, or my my job to control his. We're just like we're we're traveling the same direction, both excited about doing the same stuff, and we just contribute our skills however we can. Um, but as it con- it concerns our external, like the hierarchy, as it concerns our external people, I I arguably have the most management experience, uh, especially when it comes to game content. When I was an art manager, I did a lot of outsourcing management, and um, at Super X Studios, I also did some outsourcing, you know, for animation and all sorts of assets. And so, when it comes to managing our, let's say, external contributors, I tend to be the one to sort of foot the the elbow grease for, um, you know, managing the assets and and providing any direction to them although i still like i still try to carry that spirit forward of like chris kukla is working on this soundtrack because he loves the idea of this game and he's got a vision for what it should sound like so i'm not trying to micromanage what the soundtrack should sound like i've just i try to give him like hey man this next biome we're gonna make here's what it looks like i feel like it's like really mysterious or 
um, it's like an elevated place on like another plane. And like, so I'm thinking maybe these, you know, some highfalutin sounds, but it's also, you know, I'm just trying to give him vibe effectively for the location so that that can inspire him to do what he does best, which is, you know, make the music that's appropriate for that place. Right. Um, and I'm not sure if you can talk about this, given that uh, you joined the team later. But um, do you know how this game came into being? Sort of the motivations for why it was created? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, me and Sheridan are close friends, and so I'd be, I'd be echoing most of what he would say about that, probably. But I think the short story is that, is that. Um, you know, Sheridan was in some ways a lot like myself growing up in that he, you know, was really attracted to computer hobbies and games. And so he had a big love for games like Doom, even though even though he's a bit younger than me, he still grew up on a lot of the same titles. I don't know if it was because he was using like, you know, a hand-me-down computer from his brothers or something. But, you know, he got into Doom and, um, and he was actually playing NetHack. And one day he was just like, hey, what if... What if you could play NetHack in first person like Doom, but it had co-op? And so that's that's what really spawned the, uh, the the idea and the passion in his head to make that game. And he had been studying, you know, how game engines work. He follows John Carmack a lot, and so he wanted to build his own game engine. So he built a, hit the Barony game engine in C, um, just himself. You know, he's like a I think he was younger than twenty when he built the uh, starts the foundation of the Barony game engine. And uh, just put it together himself. And for him, I think it was as much a passion of like, you know, yeah, there's there's definitely a creative outlet with, you know, fulfilling some um, creative hunger to make a game that has some of the best parts of Doom and NetHack in them. But also just he's really excited by making the technology that games are built on. He's That's kind of part of who he is, is he, he loves getting his head deeply wrapped in those software engineered systems. Like I don't, I don't know the last time you guys have talked to an indie that like they just built their own game engine, but it's like pretty rare, and that's the kind of guy that Sheridan is. I mean, I think that was literally last week. Oh, really? That's awesome. What but, game? Um, I think it was un. Yeah, it was Unmetal. Unmetal. I feel like I've heard of that. I'll have to look look more into that. Um, cool. Do you know Unepic? Okay, yeah, th- see, that's where I, yep, I, I, I might have seen that come up in my YouTube feed, you guys doing that interview with him. That's awesome, I didn't realize that you made that engine, but I did play Unepic when it came out, and it definitely doesn't seem like a Unity game or, or a, even a Game Maker game, it's very much its own thing. So that's awesome, that's cool. Yeah. Um, that's because it was actually made for the MX, MSX. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, or, it, yeah I mean... Taking a note of that. <laughs> what's yeah, once again, those details are in that interview. That's um, awesome. I'll watch that. Yeah. Plus, um, engine talk has been coming up a lot in our interviews lately. Mainly oh, I bet. Because Unity. Yeah. Like, you know, the, that Unity announcement just hit the scene like a, an atomic bomb. Mm-hmm. Um, so interestingly enough, we haven't uh, come across a developer that's actually working in Unity um, yet. I'm sure it will at some point. Because yeah. you know, e- even though I know there's a lot of turmoil in the Unity scene, it's not like people can just drop the engine if they're like halfway through a game. Um, yeah. But that is definitely a you know that is a topic for another day. You know, Barony isn't facing that um, particular uh, <laughs> issue. Yeah, um, well, and as it pertains to Barony, one of the one of the sort of dark ironies that Sheridan and I have discussed about this, because of course, you know, in the industry, it, we're obsessed with this topic as, as well. We enjoy watching the train wreck. And um, I mean, for starters, we're, we're, we're just glad that we can observe this from a purely academic perspective of just like, wow, this is, it's interesting to watch how this goes down. Cause it, yeah, it could be our whole livelihood on the line. And for us to only have been working full-time for ourselves for you know a little over a year 
like to have that suddenly threatened would be very, you know, it would be, it would be like taking the dream away that we had, you know, had just barely accomplished. Uh, but the other thing is, is that when Sheridan first started taking the game to like indie developer conventions, like he'd get, he'd get sat next to game teams that were using unity and they would all criticize him for building his own engine. They're like, don't you know, common industry wisdom is that you don't bother building your own engine. Why aren't you using unity? And he had a lot of valid reasons at that time, but I mean, the, this one about the licensing issues and you know the costs and being at their mercy basically like that wasn't even um, that's not something those developers were concerned with at that time and uh, turns out you know it's a big deal. Right. Uh, I mean, the thing is, uh, there were um, issues with Unity even prior to that. Yeah. Like, um, uh, you know. Is like even before that announcement, like Unity has been doing a fine job of digging itself into the ground. <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, there was the commentary on monetization. There's been the adware and um, uh, spyware and um, AI debate. Yeah, I saw their, the NFTs thing on, uh, on yeah. Twitter cracked me up. That they they tried to pretend that like NFT didn't it, like it stood for something else in their internal chat <laughs> because the because word got out that they're doing it they're like oh no we didn't mean non fungible tokens we meant uh, neuro uh, fraternization um, teddy bears like just oh my, I mean it wasn't as bad I'm being silly but um, yeah. it was very it was very much like a steamed hams situation as <laughs> right. one user pointed out oh jeez. I, but yeah, um, yeah, it, it's a shit show basically. <laughs> yeah. I, but you know, thankfully your game doesn't have to deal with it. That's right. Um, We're very grateful for that. Uh, anyway, um, speak. You know, refocusing on Barony. Oh, um, this was the subject of a couple of big updates recently. That's um, right. Uh, I'm trying to remember, like there. Well, first, we'll start with... It appeared on the Nintendo Switch. Yeah. Uh, two months ago, I believe? Yeah, August 1st was our release date. Yeah. Um, so, was the porting process handled internally? Yep. Yeah, we did all the work ourselves. Uh, which is insane to think about looking back on it. It was, it was a lot of work. Um, but, you know, it's paying off. Uh, we did it all internally, so that that was motivated by a like I'm not I, I don't actually quite remember the story of how we finally decided to do the Kickstarter. I know that Sheridan and I had lunch one day together, and we were talking about you know he was thinking about you know what it would take to do a mobile port of the game, and then um, you know we were always talking about our next project. You know, do we want to move on to our next game or whatever? Um, and then one day, he, I, I think he might have brought it up to be like, you know, I don't think it would be that hard to port Barony to the Switch. And uh, and it might be fun to give it a shot. And I was like, you know, well, um, I'm open to that. Like, I'm always excited. You know, we have a game that's basically done and people like it already. Like, to bring it to a new console platform is like, that, there could be, that could be a good move. And pe friends had been suggesting for years, you know, the Switch would be the perfect platform for Barry. And I saw that boulder death, by the way. Um, I, th I found it amusing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I mean I'm sorry for your for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I yeah again I don't know why I don't remember quite remember the conversation, but I had had a friend that I worked with at Wargaming, and um, uh oh, is Golix snoring? Yeah, Golix. Oh shit! Sorry, <laughs> I thought I had my microphone off. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> sorry, dude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. You uh, th th This is the perils of live broadcasting or live mm -hmm. recording. No, <laughs> and I know. Um, this is this is content. I'm loving it. Anyway, I will I will be more careful and try not to doze off. <laughs> yes. I'll try to be more entertaining. It, it, <laughs> it's fine. It's, it's, it's not fine. you at all. <laughs> He's just uh, tired and lacks caffeine. Uh, don't worry. It's all good. Anyway, um, porting the game to the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, I think it might, it might have just been a discussion between us where we said, you know, 
maybe this could be a chance to run a Kickstarter. And if people just demonstrate through a Kickstarter that there's a demand for the product on the Switch, then like, let's go ahead and make it. So it may have been more of um, it's it's so silly to me that I don't remember the details of how we decided to do this. But um, eventually we all agreed. Eh, if a Kickstarter fails, that means nobody really wanted it. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's fine. Or, you know, if the Kickstarter succeeds, then people really do want this. And maybe it will sell well on the Switch and it'll be worthwhile. So we ran the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, I should say that, you know, I primarily led that Kickstarter campaign. And the reason why, you know, of course, the other guys contributed quite a bit. I don't want to undermine uh, what they had to had to do to keep that Kickstarter going. But um, I had just started a job at Harebrain Schemes when we were, um, like, it was, like, the same day that our Kickstarter went live. So did so did my first day at Hairbrain Schemes. It was like it was a it was a real chaotic situation for my personal life to be, do, be doing both of those things at the same time. I can so, imagine. Yeah, I had to I had to give up, you know, basically all of my life to do both of those things at the same time. Hairbrain Schemes, by the way, a studio I really really enjoyed working at, and I I didn't and you know I loved the Shadowrun games that they had made, and I certainly didn't want to make a bad impression there. So I was working doing my best to do a good job there. Um, but in the meantime, you know, off hours running a Kickstarter. So, um, I got in touch with a friend I met at Wargaming Seattle, uh, who had, I had heard had moved on to Nintendo in their publishing, uh, department. Uh-huh. And I asked him, you know, what it would take to get a dev kit. And luckily, apparently like at that time, the only way really to do that was to know somebody. So I was just really lucky that we knew somebody. And so we were able to get dev kit access Sheridan put together a proof of concept port for the Switch um, before the Kickstarter even started. And so we were able to show a video of the game running on the Switch, but it was like, it was running at like 40% speed. Like it wasn't, like there was still plenty of work to do in other words, but we proved that it was within our capability to get the game on the Switch. So that's what we built the Kickstarter on is that promise. Mm. And, um, to make the to make that prospect more exciting, we also said we're going to redo all of the UI so that the game will be playable with game pads and not just playable but comfortable. And the new UI will look good. And um, so that turned into, you know, basically a promise that was we're going to replace every single bit of UI in the whole game. And um, it was it was three years worth of work, is what it was. It was a massive undertaking. Um, like we could have built a new game in the same amount of time, but instead we decided to upgrade Barony. And you know, no regrets. Uh, things have been going well since then. But that was, uh, yeah, that was that. That's what the Kickstarter and Switch port got us was this, this what we called the quality of death update. Right. And did you have to make any compromises to get the Barony on the Nintendo Switch? You know, like other than like adjusting the UI more. Like, did, did you have to downgrade the graphics? Uh, no, actually, like, there was, you might say there was some trade-offs, but it ultimately ended up being for the good of all platforms the game was on. Um, we're, like, we're hardcore RPG fans. Like, we love Morrowind and, like, System Shock. Uh, and, you know, you know, to speak for a hardcore old school immersive sim, you know, just like those are that's our bread and butter. And we're not big fans of the trend of like games getting quote unquote dumbed down for mainstream audiences. Uh, so definitely the last thing that we wanted to do was to consoleize Barony and make it different, like make it a different experience. We wanted it to be as good on the Switch as it was on the PC, but with a UI that felt good on it, but also looked good. And I think Barony's UI before the quality of death update was it's like it's number one. It's like the biggest lightning rod for criticism was the old UI because it was, you know, and by design to some extent, it was just very quick and dirty to put together that UI. You know, it's like draw a box, put letters in it. Like that's what our that's what our UI was before. But having to go through and rethink every bit of UI so that it's as effective as possible at communicating information so that it, you can do four-player split-screen, which is, by the way, like, I challenge anyone to name a four-player split-screen RPG um, from the last 20 years uh, where you can manage all your inventories and stuff simultaneously. I don't know of anyone else who's done it. Um, except for maybe Vagante, but that's a side-scroller, so kind of a different <laughs> problem to deal with. 
Right. So, like, you know, that was it was other than the fact that it was a massive amount of work, I would say that we didn't have to sacrifice anything. Like, uh, some some things to dive into a little more detail. Like, we had to, we ended up, we did end up running into some performance issues on the Switch, um, but it was mostly due to the fact that we were using some, uh, I guess you could say, outdated rendering methods that newer updates to OpenGL would allow us to to do better and more efficiently. And um, so Sheridan ended up rewriting the game's renderer and so that it performed better. For, like, we, we would not have done that if the Switch didn't need us to, but also rewriting the renderer also allowed us to add colored lights to the game and smooth shading to all of our voxel models to the game, something that it previously didn't have. So it's just a direct upgrade to all of our visuals, plus it performs better on every system. Like the only thing we had to lose because of that is now we couldn't, we had to update from an old version of OpenGL to a newer version of OpenGL, which meant certain older graphics cards couldn't play Barony anymore. So um, it's like, well, it can run on systems that are 10 years old. Is that good enough for us? And we ultimately decided like, okay, I, I guess we can give up a few of our ancient, you know, OpenGL cards. Yeah, to, to like, make Barony run run and look better, you know. Right. Um, now, does this game support crossplay uh, between PC and Switch? Yeah, it sure does. Um, yeah. The, so there's only a few incompatibilities when it comes to crossplay, and that is that um, you have to, we we use we do crossplay through Epic Online Services, and we know that like you know. You, you use the word epic and like a um, people clutch their pearls or whatever, but uh, you know it, it's really it's not like we have embedded spyware in the game that's like telling Tencent our every move through Epic servers or anything. It's really just uh, it's really just an online service that um, the game connects to, and all it does is share your Steam user ID with Epic online services to connect games together. So um, there's like it, there's no other information that's that's you know, being plumbed or data mined by some, you know, it's not DRM, I guess I should say. So, uh, I, I just, as I, as I reveal a bit about crossplay, I think it's important to say, because I, I don't want it to be this elephant in the room that people are like, Oh, they got Epic in there, but on steam it's, it's opt in. Like, so if you don't want, you know, the smell of Epic to be anywhere near your body, like you don't even have to turn on Epic online services. So like it's, there is a, Unless you're just like against the very notion that somebody would say the word epic, um, there's it, it's costing nobody anything to not use it. So, uh, so that's what our crossplay runs through is Epic Online Services and Steam and Epic and Nintendo can all connect to that. The only thing that can't is our um, DRM free versions on GOG or the Humble Widget because uh, you have to, you know, that's the whole nature of that is you can't connect to those online services. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that was part of the process of bringing the game to the Nintendo Switch. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Well, and part of it, like one of the reasons why we decided to go ahead and like Epic Online Services, or, or I should say, crossplay was sort of a stretch goal for us. And um, one of the reasons why we just went ahead and sealed the deal and implemented it really early in development is because uh, like dealing with Nintendo's network stuff is just not something we wanted to eat more of than we had to. Um, and, you know, Epic already had a good solution for connecting players through Nintendo. Uh, and so using that got us cross-play for free, effectively, as long as, you know, our netcode was compatible, which it was. So, um, and I, I may be speaking a little bit out of turn. If my, if, my, if my homies, if my programmer buddies are listening to me, they might be annoyed that I'm using some wrong terms. But as I understand it, uh, that's what helped us make the game multiplayer at all on the Switch was using Epic's online services. And so that also got us cross-play for free. Hmm. I, I mean, I'm guessing it worked out for you? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a, it's a tiny vocal minority that complains about it. And I think it's mostly... And, you know, look, I, I, I'm not going to... 
everyone's entitled to their opinion, especially when they're concerned about, you know, Epic being in Tencent's pocket and China stealing your personal information. Like, I get it. Um, but uh, I think most of any backlash has just been uh, mostly just uninformed about what what's actually happening. People just don't understand what's really at risk because, you know, why should they know the, the depths of what our network programming requires? Um, Fair enough. Yeah. And, you know, it's just fun to play. Like, you just bring your buddy into your in your office with his Switch, and you can just play a game right next to each other. It's so rad. Like, cross-play is great. Well, um, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, and how have Switch users been responding to Barony? Uh, that's a fair question. Um, I guess I say it that way because it's not... It hasn't been like a huge hit on the Switch. Our what, what's been the the major change for us is when we released the update with uh, simultaneously with the Switch. We released that update on Steam and Epic. Like the audience has been responding a lot to the game on Steam. So mm -hmm. uh, right now, Switch is our second best selling platform, but it's uh, it's not really close. Like like <laughs> pe people on Steam are like have a new sudden obsession with the game that we can we can only assume tracks back to the quality of death release so um you know we're monitoring the numbers for me personally like one of the things i wanted to do with the switch release is just keep an eye on it and see like you know was this a it, it is does having the game on a, another console like this does this um is like is this a good reason to port it to something else like should we think about sony or xbox next and if the Switch doesn't perform well, it's kind of hard to justify doing it all over again for another platform. So we're keeping an eye on it. Barony was never a game that was like a smash hit success right out the gate. Like it took us, you know, eight years to get to where we're at now in terms of the sales being substantial. And um, so maybe it'll maybe it'll take some time to grow and find its audience on the Switch too. Um, but right now, you know, I wouldn't say. Uh, the Switch isn't moving mountains for us, but Steam has been blowing our minds. Like, I'm less surprised by that than I think other people would be. Um, just because um, I know the nature of a game like this, and I'm not surprised that, you know, the PC-born audience would be taking uh, more to it than the Switch audience. <laughs> yeah, it's like, because... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is very much a game that benefits from a keyboard and mouse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, just, you know, it's nothing against the Nintendo Switch or any platform, but, you know, you just can't do the kind of inventory management that you can on PC. Yeah. And especially for a game as hard as Barony, it's a difference, yeah. at least. Um, so along those lines, have you given any consideration to bringing Barony to Xbox or PlayStation? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to be talking much about that soon unless we see a major change in what happens on the Switch. Like, we couldn't even, uh, like, there hasn't, if you go to our Metacritic, like, uh, not a single major reviewer has reviewed our game. So, <laughs> like, it's made almost no impact in terms of the broader game industry, the fact that it's on the Switch. And so, like, being like, oh, let's do that again. You know, it's like, it's a little hard to to argue that. Even though, like, I just want to see Barony on more more platforms. Like, I think it'd just be awesome to have it more places with more players. But, you know, it's kind of like you said. Like, we found our core audience on on the PC. So, um, and there's only three of us. And, like, having the game on the Switch has an ongoing cost. Like, every time we do an update, we have to make sure that it's updated both for the Switch and for... Uh, Steam so that players can continue playing together and like Steam like you go on there and you're just like oh a release build like click and it's done but Nintendo it's like okay we'll be testing that for three weeks and we'll get back to you and once it's past our quality standards we'll go ahead and approve your patch so it's like it adds a lot of overhead to us to keep maintaining this Nintendo build and so to do that again for Sony and do it again for for Microsoft we would like we'd want to we'd want them to be making enough money that it could like justify hiring somebody to like you know to do that part of the job because it's not like we want to spend our time making more fun stuff in the game not managing 
builds with publishers. You know what I mean? Mm. And if uh, it's so, I do. So if it, yeah. So if it's not making the money to justify it, it's it's you know we'll see. Like I said, I'm I'm still optimistic, and and uh, like if the Switch version is selling enough to justify other consoles, like I'm gonna fight for it. And who knows what, how my team will feel about that? But um, yeah. But yeah, it's just um, not where we're at right now. Maybe Microsoft will one day ask for it on Game Pass or something. Like, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, moving that, uh, moving past that, um, I think the final thing we want to talk about uh, t- uh, today is the recently announced Life After Death update. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, which is version 4.1. That's right. So what's going to be in this? Yeah, so we're psyched about the Life After Death update. Uh, in the past, prior to the quality of death update, we were just sort of, we would just like release patches like willy nilly, just surprise we added something. And um, but especially now that we have this lead time with Nintendo, it's an opportunity for us to put a, a few more eggs in a basket and and say, hey, this update's coming. Look forward to it. Like Barney's, it's going to continue to be exciting. New stuff is happening. So um, that's. That's what the, you know, the Life After Death update is our first big patch where we get to do that uh, since all we've been working on for the last three years has been quality of death. And so um, we think we're going to be able to release one of these big patches about every quarter until all of our Kickstarter goals are fulfilled. So um, the major features that are in the Life After Death update are things that we've actually announced, had announced for a long time in our Kickstarter and just haven't made it into the product yet. So... Um, the one that the name of Life After Death is named after is Co-op Ghosts. Spooky ghosts! So when the player dies in a multiplayer game, you'll get to respawn as a ghost. They still gets to play in the level, and there's still some drawbacks. It's not like, you know, it's not like you just came back to life. Um, but uh, so far in our, in our testing, uh, playing a ghost is a lot of silly fun and... Uh, Kind of like a lot of things. I don't know how much time you've gotten to spend in co-op, but like you'll find that <laughs> it seems like most things can be used either to help your team or to troll your friends. And uh, that's absolutely the case with ghosts. And I'm super psyched to see how people react to them because I think they're a ton of fun. Right. Um, yeah. So they'll have and- some like some abilities and they'll be able to spot things for you in the environment and they'll help you be able to scout, but they'll also be able to like intervene in certain ways mm. sounds fun yeah i'm excited about it i'm, I'm really eager to, eager to show some stuff off uh, i just did a play test with ben last night and uh we were giggling like idiots it was great i'm, I'm very optimistic about ghosts <laughs> well, um, that's good good to hear yeah uh the second big thing is kind of connected and that's the the call outs so if you've played on the switch um you'll notice how painful it is that you can't, you don't have any way to uh, conveniently talk to people. And so, and we anticipated this would be an issue, which is why we promised it in the Kickstarter. And that is, we have a a nice in-depth tag system now. So you can just press the tag button, which I believe right now by default is the, is down on the D pad and just point at anything in the world and click on it. And it'll just do a basic tag spot. Like you're used to from any other, co-op game like Vermintide or even like Apex Legends or whatever. They all have tag systems of some kind. But Mm. where ours goes a little further is that if you press the tag button again without actually tagging anything, um, it brings up a wheel of options uh, that are super context sensitive. So like if, uh, if you need help, you can just call out for help and the game will say, you know, It'll say your character name and it says they're calling out for help and it'll say in parentheses, you know, needs healing or needs food, depending on the status of your character. So it's Paladin communicating needs food badly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we should get that voice actor. That'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, bringing it uh, full circle. That's I right. Know. Good point. Yeah. Return yeah. to Gauntlet. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but like you could also point at, let's say there's an amulet that you can't identify because you're playing like. A, a, a warrior or something. It starts with a really low perception. So you might drop the amulet on the floor, point at it, click tag, and then say help, and your character will say, I need help with this amulet. And so if you have, you know, like a merchant or a rogue in the party who's good at appraising, 
they might be like, oh, okay, I'll come over and help with that amulet. And that's all without typing or saying a single word as you get all that context. Um, so I like the, what we played with it. It's like, it's, it's really practical, but also, man, I don't know what it is. Like we didn't plan for this, but it's also just funny sometimes. Um, it's just funny. Like you can throw an item off a cliff and then tag it and say, Hey, this item's good for me as it's like falling into the pit. And just when your buddy sees that it's, it's hard not to just giggle. So we've had, you know, cause it's, it's nonsensical. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like the game is telling you something that's complete. It's clearly going into the pit. You don't really mean that it's useful for you. And it's just, uh, it's just funny. It's just like more opportunities for silly stuff to happen in co-op. So, um, I think one of my favorite lines is if you target an ally and then give them the thumbs up command, then it'll say, you know, this ally, and it'll call them by name, whatever their name is. This ally is up to the task, it'll say. And, uh, cause you know, what else are you going to say? I, I just, yeah, you know, what else are you going to say about that ally that's a thumbs, thumbs up worthy? So you're like, you know, you've recruited a slime or somebody or like a ghoul and you click on it and it says, hey, our ghoul ally is up to the task. Like, all right, send him in. Like, in he goes. It's just, it's, to me, that's all just silly stuff that I really enjoy. So those are the two big features. Um, we've got a couple other ones. We're integrating holidays into Barony. So you'll be able to turn them off, but we have major Halloween and uh, Christmas mods that overhaul not just the look, but also the sound of the game. Like, we've um, we've got permission from a, a musician to use some of his Halloween and uh, Christmas music for our our game for the seasonal modifications. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. And if you want to right now, like those mods are available right now on the workshops, you could just go and activate them right now, but those will be integrated in the game now. So that if you're on the switch, you can actually play them because you don't have this team workshop on the switch. Yeah. Right. Uh, And those kick on like in a range before like Halloween and Christmas or whatever. That's right. Yeah. In, in those months, uh, it'll automatically be available. And then if you want to turn it off, you can just go to the menu and turn them off. If you're just like sick of hearing jingle bells or whatever. <laughs> if jingle, if you work retail at jingle, bell, jingle bells, trigger a primal rage inside of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you don't want to come home and do more of that. Yeah. I hear that. I worked, I worked GameStop for a Christmas. I, uh, yeah, I, memories, <laughs> they haunt me. <laughs> more flashbacks. That's right. Like, um anyway yeah that sounds uh good and exciting and um i'll see if my colleagues here have anything further to ask you i think i'm good okay um right then um so josiah i want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule and being with us here today to talk about barony um you're very welcome and thanks again for the invite it's been a pleasure no problem no problem um, anyway, the game is Barony. It's currently available on pretty much any PC storefront you could name, um, as well as the Nintendo Switch. Um, it currently retails for $19.99 uh, for the base pack. Or if you want to pick it up for piece, it's $64.99. Um, it also has the DLCs Legends and Pariah for $3.99, Myths and Outcasts for $3.99. And the extended soundtrack by Chris Kula for four ninety nine, in a DLC cart uh, package for twelve dollars ninety seven. Um, so be sure to pick those up today. Um, if you enjoyed the interview, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Um, hit the notification bell so you'll know when we go live. Um, be sure to join our Discord. Um, you know you can usually find that link at our Twitch page as well. And yeah. So that about uh, that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Coming up on the week ahead, um, right? Coming up in about twenty-ish minutes will be the season finale of Moonhawk Studios presents. Um, we are looking forward to that. Um, coming up on Friday, September twenty-seventh, or sorry, uh, Friday, September twenty-ninth. Um, looking at the wrong date there. Um, we'll be having Josh of Stuffed Wombat Games. Um, he is currently developing the immersive sim called Mona Lisa. Um, it's an interesting uh, beast, if nothing else. And um, I'm looking forward to talking that um, on Friday. Um, and coming up on the Sunday reviews... Um, 
we will be having reviews of Uchi Kano, Living With Our Lovers, um, Ultimate Fishing Simulator, TTV3, and Impressions of Paw Paw Destiny. Um, so until next time, I shall wish you good gaming. <laughs>